please welcome Kerry Chikorovsky. Oh, thank you for having me. Kerry, thank you very much for joining us today. You're the first politician, former politician we have had in the show. <laughs> Probably says something about politicians yeah. or ex ones anyway. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, Chikorovsky as well. That's a, it's a great name, Chikorovsky. Yes, I actually married it. I've got to be honest. Um, ah, it's yes. my ex husband's name, and people ask me why now that I'm divorced. Am I still Chikorovsky? And I've got to say, it was the perfect name for politics. It won't surprise anybody here that I was a f very fondly known by everyone as Chika. Chica. Chica. So, I mean, today I can walk into a pub and someone will come up and say, oh, good day, Chica, what are you up to? So I kept it. Um, my ex-husband wasn't concerned that I'd kept it, <laughs> so it was uh, very amicable. I got the name in the divorce. And that was the name of your, that was the name of your book as well. Yeah, well, because I was known as Chica, um, yeah. it seemed the obvious thing when I did my autobiography to actually call it Chica. Absolutely. I didn't think anybody else would buy it if I, bought, you know, if I actually wrote Chikorovsky. They'd go, what the hell? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So politics, how did you get into politics? Was it, was it a childhood dream? Um, unlike most people, I made up my mind at 13 that I wanted what I wanted to do. I knew at 13 I wanted to be a politician. So I lived in New York as a child, um, lucky enough to go to the United Nations School, which was pretty political because it had kids from all around the world in it. So when things like the Arab-Israeli war were on, the um, Arab kids and the Jewish kids didn't talk to each other. When the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, all the Russian kids were pulled out of school because the parents were concerned about their safety from the Czech kids. And you know, so growing up in that atmosphere, it was a very political thing for a, even a very young child. I mean, I left there when I was 13. Uh, but I'd had the very fortunate thing in my life was that I met Robert Kennedy. Uh, um, uh, we, were at, <laughs> we were at a beach. Like in New York, to get to the beach, you've got to go really, really early because otherwise you've got to park about a million miles away. So we got to the beach at about 7 o'clock in the morning and we saw all these people setting up um, big speakers, like enormous speakers. So my father, being curious, wandered over and said, what's this all about? And the only thing that they would tell him was that there was a significant political person coming to make a speech at, on the steps at the, um, at the beach. Anyway, of course, we wandered over and it was Robert Kennedy. Now, remember, this is 1968, a long, long time ago. Not a lot of Australians in the United States. So we listened to Robert Kennedy. And if I close my eyes, he made that much of an impact. I can still see him standing on those steps. It was extraordinary. But as we was walking back through the crowd, my father um, shouted out, good on you, mate. And of course, you know, good on you, mate. No one said that in the States at the time. So he came over to say hello. Oh. And we actually talked to him for about five minutes and it was kind of, I always say, which sometimes upsets my Catholic friends, I felt as if I'd been touched by God when he shook my hand. It was that awesome experience. And wow. I have no doubt that that was part of the reason why I wanted to be a politician. And what took you to over to America? So my father did work for the United Nations. Okay, so so he, um, he actually worked for the organisation. He wasn't a diplomat, he actually worked for the UN. And does he encourage you to... Well, go into the world of politics. Well, the thing, interesting thing is that I'm the eldest of four girls. Right. So in my house, there was never a conversation about, well, girls can only do this and boys can do that. In my house, the girls can do anything was the mantra. I always say that my mother and my father mm -hmm. were the best feminists and the first feminists well, I yeah. ever met. Yeah. Because my mother in particular, my mother was typical of her generation, got married, gave up working, looked after the family. But she had a very strong view that her four daughters should be educated mm -hmm. and most importantly should be able to look after themselves financially yep. during their lives. So she encouraged us all to get you know, well educated, go to uni as much as we could. And when I told her that I wanted to be a politician, she in particular said, no worries, great idea and encouraged me all the way. My father was a bit of a political animal. He actually was involved in local government. So okay. it didn't surprise him either that I wanted to be a politician, even at that age. When did it turn from that sort of childhood dream, meet Robert Kennedy, into actually reality? Lots of people have a dream to become a pop star, or prime minister. How so did you change it? So I was pretty focused. I went to a Catholic girls' school and... Um, one of the nuns there remembers me telling her at 13 that I wanted to be a politician. And again, all credit to the school, not a lot of women in politics in the 19, late 1960s, but they encouraged me to think that I could do that as well. Yeah. So my focus was pretty clear. I actually decided to do uh, law at university, yep. not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but because I thought it would be useful for me being a politician. So I did that. I went and did my law degree. I worked for a little while as a, um, as a lawyer and then I ended up having 
two children. And what was fairly typical of my age group, when I did that, I took time off from full-time work. So I actually ran a practice, a small practice from home. I taught at the College of Law part-time. And I did that for a few years. But I actually had not gotten to my goal of being a politician in my early 30s. And I actually thought I would have been there by the time I was in my early 30s. So I have a fairly pivotal moment in my life. And this crowd is far too young to relate to what, to what I'm about to say. But oh, not I, them all, not them all. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I remember one Sunday night um, that I was standing ironing the school uniforms, right? You do that Sunday night, get ready for the kids for school. And I'm, there was something on television. I don't know what it was. I can't remember. But all of a sudden, I'm standing at the ironing board, bawling my eyes out. And uh, my then husband, Chris, turned around and said, what's wrong? I mean, he hadn't said anything. There was nothing that he'd done that had upset me, but I'm bawling my eyes out. And I said, I'm 34 years of old. All I've ever wanted to do is be a politician and I'm nowhere near my goal. And he's a very sensible man, my ex-husband. And he said, well, stop crying about it and go do something about it. So the next day, I actually picked up the phone to the um, local member where I lived, and I lived in Lane Cove, who I knew. And I said to John Dowd, um, I want to come and have lunch with you. And he went, yeah, sure. So I went into Parliament House. I'm not sure that he was expecting what I was about to say, but I walked into Parliament House and I said to him, I want your job. Um, and wow. most politicians aren't too keen about people taking over from them, but he actually was very clear. And he said to me, yep, I'm going to retire in four years or five years' time. I think you need to work on a plan and you can have my job and I will work with you. And so that was great. So there you go. I was suddenly on track. What happened? <laughs> Tell me. So I had a five-year plan. And I don't know whether you all have five-year plans, but I had a five-year plan. That's good. And the five-year plan was that I was going to spend the next three years getting better known, to your point, yeah. getting more skilled, make sure that I knew what I was going to do as a politician, all that sort of stuff. And that was fantastic until John Dowd decided to resign as the local member four days before Nick Greiner called the uh, 91 election. So my five-year plan at that stage was about eight months in, not as well advanced <laughs> as I'd hoped it to be. And so my father rang me and he said, John Dowd's been trying to find you all day. And I said, why? And he said, well, he's just announced he's resigning from Parliament. Oh, wow. And I went, oh, that's sort of a slight hiccup. So to his great credit, my, um, as I said, Chris, my husband at the time, walked in the door that night and said to me, have you nominated yet? And I went, hold on, there was a four, you know, there was a five year plan, we're only halfway, well, only eight months into it. Don't we need to talk about it? And he said, no, he said, because if you don't put your hand up now, you will never have another opportunity in this seat because whoever's going to get it is going to be there for the next 20 years and you don't want to wait that long. So um, it was a mad rush, and there's a very long story about how I got pre selected, but the but the there was no expectation I could win the pre-selection because they no opened nominations and closed them on one day. On the Thursday, they pulled all the names out of the hat for the people who were the pre-selectors on the Friday. They had the pre-selection on the Sunday, which was two days after the election had been called. Um, and normally in a pre-selection, you go around and you meet everyone and you introduce yourself and you explain to them why you're very well yeah. qualified for this job. Well, none of that happened. I was actually on the phone talking to people and that was the best I could do. Anyway, long and short of it was I was up against an existing Minister of the Crown who was trying to come down from the Upper House to the Lower House, John Hannaford, really nice guy, actually a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and we went to the pre-selection on the Sunday night and quite to everybody's surprise, there were 50 people in the room. I got 22 votes on the first round. <laughs> um, but I got 26 on the second round wow. and I won the pre-selection. And so suddenly from teaching at the College of Law, I was suddenly thrown into an election campaign and kind of it didn't stop from there. What were you saying on the phone? What was it about you? <laughs> what were you, those qualities that you had that you think got you to be selected and then to be become the first? I'd had some very good advice from, okay. uh, from someone who you might know, John Howard. No. I'd no. rung John, who I'd known quite well, and I said, you know, I've got this pre-selection. And he said, look, there's one thing I would say to you. Do not harp on about being a woman. He said, because it's clear that you are a woman. <laughs> um, you don't need to be throwing that you into their face us. that, you know, they need to pre-select a woman. What you need to do is talk to them about what you can bring to the parliament. And I think what I was bringing to the parliament was that I was a local. I yep. mean, my kids were at the school locally. I'd grown up in the area. 
I was, uh, you know, I was someone who was in touch with what that community was needing in terms of its infrastructure and all those sorts of things. I'd gone up and chatted to the police and talked to them about their needs for a new station, all those sorts of things. So I think I persuaded them on the night that um, that I could do the job. But I also had a pretty good ending line for my pre-selection speech because I finished it off by saying, I think we need to acknowledge here tonight that John Hannaford, who is the minister trying to come down, is the front runner in this, in this um, pre-selection. Uh, but what I'd say to you tonight is that if you pre-select with me, you end up with two very good members of parliament, not just one. And I think that's what swayed some people in the end. And so what were your expectations going in? The world, your hopes and expectations, so I would say. Uh, well, I became a member of parliament and I'd always wanted to be a politician because I wanted to be able to do things for people. Okay. Um, I know that sounds kind of, you know, pretty basic, but and most people probably don't think that's why people would become politicians, but I genuinely just wanted to be able to get on and get things done for people. Mm. So... Um, was there anything burning? Was there any major burning um, issue that you wanted to solve? Is it? Well, as, as a young mum, yeah. There were, you know, there were issues around how you balance work and family. I mean, for me, that was one of the big issues that I wanted to have some input into. Um, I certainly wanted to have some input into the education system, and you know, I'd gone through it myself, and I had kids coming through it, and I wanted some, you know, input into that. Um, quite unexpectedly, I ended up as industrial relations minister yeah. when John Fay made me IR minister, and I'd actually majored in IR at uni. And so when John Fay rang me and said, I'd like you to be the Industrial Relations Minister, I said, oh, my God, that's my major at university. And he laughed. He said, well, you'll be a minister who actually knows what they're talking about, which is you know, <laughs> kind of <car> nice. <laughs> so um, so there, were, you know, there were those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, being, I wanted to be a local member because I knew that local members were the people who really didn't know where else to go, mm. went to for help. Yeah. So the range of things you helped people with was extraordinary. Housing, clearly, trying to get people into housing department, but all sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, you know, just one example, I had a group of women in my electorate who were Afghani, nice. and they'd made a very difficult decision to leave domestic violence situations, and so they were in housing department accommodation in my electorate. And uh, their kids were at the local school, and I would get a phone call from them and they couldn't speak very much English. But we worked out that the problem was there'd been a note home from school and these women were so terrified of authority, they thought that there were problems with their kids at school. So it was simply resolved. These kids, women used to take their children to school. Oh, so they were getting a note from yeah, the principal? Just a note from the principal. They okay. couldn't read it and the kids, their English wasn't great enough, they couldn't read it, but they're getting these notes home from school. Right. Anyway, I rang the, the principal. Yeah. And I said to the principal, you need to be at the front gate tomorrow and talk to this woman because I don't know what's on the note because she can't read it to me. Anyway, um, he, he did. He went and he waited at the front gate. She brought them. I told her, go see the principal. He was at the front gate and the child was getting a prize. Oh, and, and so, isn't that and lovely? they sent the note home to make sure she was there. Yeah. But I mean, it was just, it's things like that Those which people don't think about. But mm. she had no, she knew no one else to ring. So she rang, yeah. she would ring me and ring my office. Because you're really in touch with the people. Oh, loved it. That was the best part of it. I mean, yeah. being a minister, being leader of the opposition, that was great. Yeah. But being able to do really simple things yeah. which help people in their lives was, was for me, part of the, you know, the best part of it. Yeah, and so would you say that would be probably your proudest like, achievements while you were in as a politician Yeah, in look, government? I think the local member stuff was fantastic, but I yeah. do have some other ones. I mean, because I was Industrial Relations Minister and Minister for Women, mm. um, I'm very proud of the fact that we introduced the first formal um, flexible working conditions into the public service. They were the first written flexible working conditions in any organisation in Australia. Mm. And they were taken up by a lot of other organisations. That's a long time ago and I'm sure they've all evolved now. But, evolved, yeah. but to actually have a formal process where people could say, look, I need to actually have, mm. you know, I need to be able to do a three-day, two-day fortnight. Mm. Things like that. We actually allowed all that to happen. And I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, that's great. And so... In terms of the challenges, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going into politics, you obviously wanted to get to the top, which you did. You, you made it to the leader as leader of the, um, the New South Wales Liberal yep. Party. And you were the first woman to do so. Yep. What was, so what were some of the major challenges along the way? Uh, look, I think the, uh, you know, obviously work-life balance. I didn't do that very well because when I, um, 
when I was a minister. I became a minister after 12 months and that yeah. was kind of a bit of a shock to, to everybody, I think, including my husband. Yeah. Um, and, like, I didn't get the work-life balance right. I think my, if you talk to my husband, he would, he would, my ex-husband, he'd say to you that he would, good mum and not such a good wife. And I acknowledge that up front because I got so consumed by it all mm. that I was always g- making sure I had time for the children, So, uh, but I didn't have time for him. And that's being totally honest about it. And I think he would... He would actually say that's true too. Absolutely. He'd do, you say think that's go, true. do you think going back in time now, though, you would be able to have changed that? Totally. I mean, so I, you would be able to, even though... Yeah, and I, I, when I speak to women, and I'm always encouraging gentlemen, I know there's gentlemen in the room, but I'm always encouraging women to, to step up and to actually push themselves and to try things which they don't think they can do. But I always say to them, you need to do two things when you do that. You need to have confidence in yourself. But you also need to make time. You need to make time for your partner. You need to make time for your kids. And you need to make time for yourself. And I did the kids and one, but kids. lousy on the, on the partner and myself. Right, so yeah. I know now, so I went because when I became leader of the opposition, at that <coughs> stage I didn't have a partner, so I didn't have to worry about that part. But I very much made sure I made time for myself. So that's when I started exercising. Yeah. You know, I got a... <laughs> I got a I got a twitch under my eye. From stress. It's from stress, right? I've seen so I get this. this twitch under my eye. And <laughs> I went to my doctor. And I said, look, I've got this twitch and it's incredibly embarrassing. Like, I'm in press conferences and they're asking me really serious questions. And, and I'm, you're you know, and, and I'm giving a serious answer. Like, no, I don't think that man should be released for jail, from jail because he committed all these horrible crimes. And <laughs> it was not a good look, let me tell you. It was <laughs> not a good look. So I went to the doctor and he said, well, I can Botox it. And I wasn't co- too keen on that. And he said, or else you start exercising. And that really was a reality check for me yeah. because then I realised... All this stuff that I've been doing, I haven't been p- making time for me. So, yes, work, my, my experience, children, partner, work, you. Yeah. That's the way I'd put it. That's the way I'd actually put it. It was like the term burnout even used back then. I was well, you can't use that for politicians because that's a sign of weakness. Right. So, um, so I, you know, I think you operate on a very high level. I mean, the problem with politics, and it's worse now than when I was there. When I was there, there was some downtime, right? There was some downtime. Okay. Um, but I, y- as leader of the opposition, for example, I had to be on call 24-7. Something blew up, I'd get a phone call from the media, I'd be on the radio. I was very glad they didn't have video phones, let me tell you. That yeah. would have been the worst of my nightmares, to get up at 5.30 in the morning and have to put my makeup on before I made a call. Um, but, you know, they're... You are on 24-7. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's very high-powered, it's stressful. In this day of media now, uh, you know, social media now, I think mm. it's even worse y- yeah. because, you know, everybody's a reporter, everybody's got a camera. It wasn't quite that bad when I was there, but it was still pretty stressful. But the one thing you can't do, particularly as a leader, is admit that you're not coping. You just can't admit that because if you do, all your colleagues are going to say, well, that's the reason why we need to get rid of her or whatever. Worse than that, the media will go after you. And, in fact, I had a particularly horrendous um, press conference on one day. Um, Like, I don't even know what I'd gone down to the gallery to talk about, but the the media gallery in the New South Wales Parliament is below ground. And so there's a big room like this, and you sit up the front. Yeah. So So how far into – just so we can get time frames? Oh, when I'm leader of the opposition. Okay. So probably halfway through my 18 months in, two years in or something. Okay, yep. Anyway, so I go down to this press conference and um, they just went me. Like, I can't tell you. It was so vicious and it just was on, on just non-stop for half an hour. It was unbelievably vicious. So vicious that my press secretary up the back, she's in tears for me. Anyway. And just hammering you with yeah, questions after questions. And, after and question. really, really hard, awful stuff, right? Not, not about policy, just about everything. Anyway, it was awful. Anyway, so <laughs> I went upstairs and I went, oh, my God. Nicola came in, my press secretary, and as I said, she's still crying. And I, th- I said, what was that all about? Anyway, she, um, she said, I don't know. And then there's a phone call and it's my receptionist. And she said, look, I've got one of the uh, journalists from the gallery here. She wants to come and see you. And I went, oh, my God, what do they want what now? The I mean, what else can they do? Yeah. Anyway, it was one of the female journos. And um, she came in and she said, I've come to apologise to you. I said, well, you've got nothing to apologise for. It wasn't you. It was the blokes who were doing it. There were four, three men in particular, one peripherally, but four, but three in particular. And she said, yeah, but I knew they were going to do that. And I said, what do you mean? I said, she said, I knew they were going to go after you. And I said, how did you know they were going to do that? She said, because they were plotting in the media common room to make you cry. Because if they could make you cry, 
they could then report on the television that night that you weren't coping. Wow. So not coping as a particularly as a female politician mm. is one of the things that you avoid at all costs. So they were very disappointed. Apparently very disappointed. Wow. Pissed off enormously, is what I'm told, that I couldn't uh, break down for them. Hor that's horrendous behaviour because I wasn't, I'm Irish, so I wasn't in the country when you were um, in politics. But I was here for Julia Gillard being yep. um, Prime Minister. And I have to say, I was embarrassed and I was ashamed of being a journalist at the time of how she was treated in the press. How, and I, I don't know, I've never spoken to Julia mm. Gillard since she was Prime Minister, but how do you cope with that in the background? Uh, well, I think the biggest mistake I made was that I didn't talk to anyone about it. Um, I just felt that I had to, you know, buckle up. Yeah. Someone once said to me, um, one of the journalists once said to me, you know, you've got the best smile in politics. And I said, yep, that's because I've had to use it more often than most because, you know, I just had to smile through that stuff. But I do think, how do you cope with it? I had some, I had a couple of good friends who I could talk to about it. But most of the time I just grin and bear it and I actually think that was the wrong thing to do um, and I again when I talk to people now I say if you are not coping if yeah. you are having a bad day make sure you have a group of people or one person who you can go to yeah. and talk to and that person needs to be completely non-judgmental mm -hmm. that's you just need someone who you can unload to because yeah. there are going to be times when you're not coping my problem was there were no other females at my level so, um, and I certainly couldn't have talked to any of my colleagues because, mm. again, mm, good reason to get rid of her. Um, but there weren't a lot of other women around. Yeah. And a lot of the blokes wouldn't want to admit that they weren't coping either. So it was the biggest mistake I made. I reckon if I had actually unburdened myself and admitted and gone and got some help, mm, you know, just talking to people, I may have actually still made Premier. That's how much I think I made a mistake. So that's, so actually just seeking some help, saying, okay, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not coping at the moment yep. and uh, and seeking mentors because you mentioned um, John Howard being a yep. sort of a mentor as such. Um, so that's the importance of mentors, having really good mentors. Yeah. But you see, even with John, I didn't feel confident enough going to tell John because... Because you couldn't show your weakness. Yeah, because I was female and I was a leader and I, you know, toughen up, sunshine, take a dose of concrete. And what did the what do the blokes what did the blokes in Parliament do at the time? Well, they weren't getting as rough a time in um, from the, the press. They certainly, yeah, and there was, I mean, I, I did not have, normally when you're a politician, you get a hu what they call a honeymoon period. Yeah. And from the time I went in, I didn't, you never. They were just after me from the day I walked in. And, um, I mean, I'm not blaming them, that's their job, you know. You, you want to be a politician, toughen up, you know, bear it. But I think, as I said, the, the issue for me was not that I wasn't able to bear it publicly. Yeah. But I thought that I had to bear it privately and yeah. I needed really needed to have spoken to someone about it. I had one really bad day I had one really bad day I remember and um, it was about the only time I had a drink in the whole time well from the tw uh, for most of the time I was in politics oh Actually, really yeah I just because I didn't drink when I was in politics because you know you never knew when you're gonna have to make a as I said Phone radio call, interview or yeah. whatever so I didn't drink very much Made up for it since. <laughs> oh no, I didn't say that, did I? Good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so but there, there was one really bad day where I just couldn't see which way I wanted to go. But I got over that and then moved on. Tell me about the actual decision to leave politics. So what happened was um, my colleagues, in their wisdom, decided that they wanted a new leader, which is you know that happens in politics. So, yeah. Um, so I lost the leadership ballot by one vote. Oh. And I know exactly whose vote it was. So Who's? Uh, that's, <laughs> that person is going to be forever, never on my Christmas card list. Anyway, so I okay. lost the ballot by one vote. Um, but what I decided was that I would actually stay because John Brogdon took, to over, took over and I have no animosity towards John. John's a nice man. Um, but I knew that John was young and I really thought that um, it would be useful to have me there as an older, wiser head. Yeah. Who'd been through an election campaign, who'd been around for, you know, 11 years. So I decided to stay. Um, but clearly there were some people on my own side who decided that that wasn't a good idea. So I started to get phone calls from the media saying, oh, we understand you're leaving. And I went, no, I'm not. I'm staying. So I had one from The Australian. I had one from The Sydney Morning Herald. And I got one from The Telegraph you know, over a series of three weeks. And yeah. I, the... the Australian and the Herald, I was able to put off and say, look, it's just not true, I'm not going. So please don't publish anything because the only people you'll upset will be my local conference people. Yeah. But the Telegraph insisted on running it. Of course. So by that stage, I decided, 
well, there's a bit of a campaign going here. Do I need to go through this for another four years? So I went away um, up to a, we had a house up the coast and I sat on the balcony for a week on my own. Left the kids, left everyone behind, told my office not to ring me. And I sat down and I went through, I actually wrote down why I should go and why I should stay. Yeah. And in the end I decided there were more reasons to go than there were to stay, including the fact that um, I have two children. They were seven and five when I went into Parliament. They were 19 and 17 when I decided to leave. And the problem with being a Chikorovsky child is you can't hide from a Chikorovsky mother. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows that, the oh, name. is that your mother? <laughs> so they were over it. They were a bit over it. So I thought, well, there's a whole lot of other things I can do. So I decided to leave. But when you went up for that week away, if you had had someone else sitting beside you, like a John Howard or somebody, do you think things could have been different? Li- could um, have been different? Well, it was really interesting because when I actually came back mm-hmm. and told some of the people who I was close to in the parliament that I'd made up my mind and I was leaving, they talk, tried to talk me out of it. Yeah. They said to me, uh, look, we actually think that there's very good reasons for you to stay, um, provide that older, wiser head, you know, make a valuable contribution. And they did try to talk me out of it. But I, look, I was quite determined. And to be honest, I think making the decision, particularly in politics, to go under your terms, I mean, mm. yes, I'd lost the leadership, but I could have stayed on, been a minister, done all those sorts of things. But I think the decision to go when I wanted to go was the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and you often don't get that. Some people ask Tony Abbott, you just get voted yeah, out. You know? Sometimes that's what happens. Yeah, and that's true. And then, But it must be difficult. How do you get over that sort of, um, you said, you know, that, oh, there's obviously a campaign here going behind, mm. behind your back. And that nasty feeling of <laughs> that backstabbing. How do you get over that? Well, I mean, I, there's, I think I don't need to go into any details about the uh, nastiness that's been in politics over the last yeah, several years from both sides of the uh, the house, particularly at the federal level. Yeah. So I think, but look, you know, to be, let's be politics. honest, there's nastiness in every workplace. It's true. And, and the problem with the, you know, with the political life is it's really public. You actually end up seeing it all in a very public way. Mm. Because most of that stuff will eventually come out. Yeah. And because the one thing about politicians, I can assure you, I'm sure you all know, they all like to talk. Yeah. And they can't help themselves, even when they've <laughs> been doing stuff they should probably keep their mouth shut about. Um, as I have been, I do a fair bit of political commentary and I have been known over the last 12 months with everything that was been going on in the Liberal Party to say on more than one occasion, I just wish they'd all shut up because Fair that's enough. what you should do. <laughs> but, you know, politicians like to talk. So, um, yeah, so I think it's very public about poli- you know, the political life, but it's, yeah. e- it's everywhere. And, it, you know. and you mentioned the current political part, our Liberal Party. What do you think of the current Liberal Party? Oh, well, I haven't <laughs> stopped smiling since the 18th of May, and I've got to be really frank about that. I, um, I think I know Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison and I worked together because he was state director when I was the leader. Yeah. He's a very good man. Yeah. Um, he's a very good man. Forget about whether he's a good politician, but he is, which he is as well, but he's a very good man. He is one of those people who is genuinely committed to yeah. working for the community. So I'm very excited about him. Uh, I think he has clear air now, uh, which is an expression we use in politics because he has neither Tony Abbott nor Malcolm Turnbull there to be uh, causing any grief. grief. Um, they can be saying things from outside, but at the moment internally within the party, he kind of, uh, you know, he, he is the miracle worker. So he's got pretty good authority to do what he wants and he will want to work for the people of New South, uh, for Australia. After you left Parliament, do you think do you think you'd still be in politics if you were a man? Look, I do think women make some decisions which men won't make. So c- clearly, for me, mm. making sure that my my children were okay. My kids were, as I said, my daughter in particular yeah. was over it. So I probably made that decision in not entirely, but in large part because they were over it. So, and I suspect men probably are less Wouldn't inclined do to do that. Yeah. Ma- not in, not not inclined, but less inclined. And the great irony of that story is that my daughter ended up working for Joe Hockey about four years later. Oh, really? And I get a phone call from her saying, Mum, why don't you run for federal parliament? To which I responded, I left parliament because you didn't want me to be a politician anymore. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm older now. <laughs> so would you go back into politics? No, not at all. Okay. No, not, at all. <laughs> not at all. No, now I can, um, I can actually go out now and have a glass of wine at dinner and not be concerned about people saying, Focal. oh, you know, she's off having another, you know, how Absolutely. many drinks has she had? Yeah. I can go out, I can have, you know, time with my friends. I don't have to worry if I go out with a friend. I went out with a mate of mine when I was a politician, um, and this is before social media. Just He was a very good friend of mine. Yeah. And we hadn't seen each other. We went to this little hole-in-the-wall Chinese restaurant up at Crow's Nest, 
And the following morning I walk in and my, one of my press guys says to me, oh, who were you out to dinner with last night? And I went, why are you asking? And he said, because I've already had a uh, phone call from what, was what used to be what is now confidential in the Telegraph, wanting to know who, you knew, who your new boyfriend is. I mean, oh, seriously? <laughs> seriously? So I can go out now and have a glass of wine a and a night out and not be worried about being in the social pages. Fair, yeah, no, fair enough. That's fair enough. And with the l when leaving politics and then deciding what you were going to do next. Mm. A lot of people associate, a lot of people put their identity with their job. So mm. like, you know, if you're a politician, now you're no longer a politician. How did you transition? Or um, I walked out without a job. I had nothing to go to, which was pretty scary because I had a, two kids and a mortgage, well, a yeah. supportive ex-husband, but till, still two kids and a um, mortgage and yeah. kids living at home with me. And that was probably the toughest part about making the decision to leave. And my mother, God bless her, said to me, you just have to have confidence in what you can do. Yeah. And you'll be all right. And so she turned out to be right because what happened was I've in, I now run a government relations business, which literally I fell into because what happened was I started this conversation with you saying that I wanted to help people. That's why I became a yes. politician. Yes. People started to come to me because they wanted me to help them now that I was out of politics with the bureaucracy and other things. And yeah. so I started to help them. And about the fourth time it happened, one of my friends who I was doing this for said, now what do I owe you? I went, nah, 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 you know, this is what I do. And he said, no, 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 that's what you used to do when yeah. you were a politician, <laughs> when you were being paid as a politician. Now you can actually charge me. And that's so that's how my business was born. Chikorovsky and Associates. Government relations, community relations. Yeah. We, help, we work a lot with startups, with uh, uh, young entrepreneurs, trying to help them get through the both the, the media maze, if you like, trying to get them publicity. My daughter does all that work. Yeah. And, um, yeah, getting them through the government bureaucracy still. What are some of the biggest challenges uh, the small businesses face? Uh, well, particularly when they have to interact with government and bureaucracy, they have no idea how to go about it. And that's not just small business. That's often big business as well because it can be pretty... Um, it can be pretty intimidating. If you've got mm. something which, you know, you think, say, it's a great idea, it's a, a new app and it's going to be fabulous, and uh, and then you have someone like me say, well, are there privacy considerations? Do we have to talk to the privacy commissioner? Is there something that the ACCC <laughs> might like to have a look at? And they all go, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. And I said, that's why you bring me in, because I, have, I don't know anything about technology. I am hopeless. I'm the first to admit that. But I do know about processes and how you need to get things to market. Yeah. What have been some of the things you took from politics that have helped you most in your business career? Uh, well, I, I think the most important thing you do in any business is make sure that you are, particularly when you've got clients, um, for me, it's yeah. working with people I like. Yeah. Um, in politics, I didn't have that option. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do now, so I think you know you need to work with if, if you have that choice, work with people you like. But the other thing is whatever you're doing, yeah. And it's the same as in politics; you have to be passionate about what you're doing. I'm not as passionate about being a government relations person as I was about being a politician, but, but I'm still passionate about making sure I get really good results for my clients. Yes. So that yeah, be pa make sure you're passionate. Find the thing which really you know you enjoy doing. Mm. I think there's nothing worse than um, in a small business doing the same thing over and over again and not really enjoying it. If it's not working for you, move on, do something else. But so a lot of people say that, you know, find, do something you're passionate about and, you know, but for people working day to day, it's, and to be able to actually find exactly what that thing is, it's, it's not that easy to identify what it is. So the flip side of that mm. is um, I also say be passionate about whatever you're doing at the moment. Because two things happen from that. You mm. might actually learn to enjoy it. That's always a good thing. But the second thing is people appreciate passion yeah, and commitment. They do. And you might find that if you're, you know, you're working in a job which is not your ideal job, but yeah. you're, you're the most enthusiastic, you're doing it to the best of your ability, you're doing it. Absolutely. You know, everyone's seeing that. Then you might find that whoever you're working for says, well, that's someone I need to take a better look at. Yeah. Maybe this is someone I've got. Maybe there's something in this organisation I could do, you know, they could do better than what they're doing now. So, and, and not, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, if you're working in an organisation, in a largest organisation, and there's something else you want to try, and you've shown that you've been very good at what you've done and you've been committed to it, mm. put up your hand. Say, you know, I want to have a go at that. I think one of the things which keep people back is that they don't think they're qualified for things. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, yeah, the only way you're going to find out is if you have a go. Yeah, well, that well, you're a prime example. You yeah. were eight months in, and then you were thrown into the yeah. into the deep end. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, with the business, you mentioned your daughter is working with you. She is. So my daughter um, has worked for. She worked for Joe Hockey. She's worked in the non-gov sector. She's worked in the private sector. She's worked for the bureaucracy. And so uh, I said to her last year, beginning of last year, listen, 
I need your skills in my business uh, because she does. I have. I can't type. Seriously, I can't type. I'm like this. <laughs> Hopeless. So we have um, we do have a lot of work where we actually need to do strategies and things like yeah. that. So and she's got a really good strategic mind. So I said, come and work with me, um, and we'll grow the business. And her idea is that, which is correct, that I'll get to the stage where I want to retire, and then she can take it over because she's a Chikorovsky as well. So she can be the new Chikorovsky and Associates. The only problem we have in this discussion is I'm thinking ten years, she's thinking five years. Right. And okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. But it often is. Um, for small businesses and actually finding a good business partner, there's a lot to be said for a mother, daughter or a father, son relationship because yep. you have that trust already. Yep. Um, what are some of the like you know, the best parts of like it's trust is a big thing for well, working together. Trust is together. a big thing and I and having confidence in her ability. And I've got to say that didn't start straight away because I'd never worked with her before. Yeah. Um, and so when she first started working with me, uh, we'd go to meetings and I'd be kind of a bit wary about what she was going to say. She impressed me so much within the first couple of months oh, that um, yeah. she can go off and do the meetings on her own now. She was really good at what she does. Fantastic. Um, but I think the the key to our success. Yeah. And um, Lisa, please don't please forgive me when I um, sorry, Lisa, if you ever watch this. this. <laughs> um, the key to our success is that we aren't not we are not in the office all the all the time all t you know together. So she actually works remotely a lot. She's yeah. she much more prefers to be at home and working remotely. We do a lot of meetings together, but you know we're not sitting at next to each other all day every day. And if she turned around and said to you, Mom, I've decided I'm going to go into politics, uh, well, what she would you won't. Say? <laughs> um, but she, if she won't did, or because, <laughs> um, only because, not of course, not only because of me, but she said, having worked in Canberra with uh, Joe Hockey, it's put her off for life. So she doesn't want to do it. But if she wanted to do it, I'd encourage her. Um, I have a son who I thought might be more inclined. But I think he's now decided he doesn't want to do it either. He doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a tough gig. And do you think things have changed much? It's like from you were like one of a few women in the nineties. Do you think things have changed? Is it easier now? We've we've, we've hemorrhaged like lots of there's really lot quality talented women. Do you think things are changing at all? Um, I think there are. There's a lot of women gone in this time in the federal parliament. There's more women now, for example, on the coalition side than there's been I think ever before. Yeah. Um, and it's not just about the number of women who go in, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is why I'm kind of not a big fan of quotas. It is about making sure that those women, when they get in there, get the opportunities to progress to higher office. Um, and whether that's prime minister, or, you know, definitely is minister. So I think we need to be making sure that the, when women go into these positions, particularly in parliament, and, mm. it's, and it's the same in the corporate world, when they go into these higher ranked positions or c working their way up, yeah. they need to be supported and in that they need to be, you know, help be skilled. I mean, one of the things which... Um, politicians, I said earlier, you know, all they want to do is talk, but they do do a lot of media. So you need to actually be media savvy, mm. both in terms of how you present, presenting and uh, communicating, and all that sort of stuff. And so we need to we need to skill people up in that. So I think it's not, un you know, I don't think it's unfair that we would actually say to all these people, you need to go and have some media training. Yeah, but that goes to the blokes as well. Um, what else are you doing outside of the business? So I sit on a number of boards. My I sit on a board for the federal government for an organisation called Our Watch, and Our Watch is about the prevention of domestic violence or prevention of violence against women and their children. Right. And as we all know, that's a huge issue. Um, the great thing about our organisation is that we're actually working towards preventing it. Um, there are a lot of services out there which are all about helping women who are, who are in those things. But, you know, we have an ultimate goal of all making sure this organisation doesn't exist because we want to get to a stage in our society where people, you know, men and women respect each other. Yep. Um, there's gender equity. There's, you know, we're not, we're not talking down to women. We're not saying just, you know, ridiculous things to girls like, oh, you know, girls can't play rugby, which is one of my other passions. I'll talk about in a second. Yes. But all, you know, all those sorts of things. So that's, that's where we're working towards. And I find that really amazing and interesting work. Yeah. Um, I sit on a board about um, adoption. Um, adoption became a very bad word in the Australian community. You probably don't know because you weren't here, but we had stolen generation and we had forced adoptions. So adoption very much went out of vogue. Um, we actually see adoption as one of a number of opportunities on a spectrum of permanency for children. Yeah. Um, so we, we've been working very hard with various state and federal governments to ensure that you know permanent placement for children yeah. is a priority. Because you know, the average number of times a child in the foster care system moves is about 14 mm. and that can't be good for anyone. So we're about that. 
Um, road safety for young people, making sure that young people um, learn and understand you know, how dangerous a car is and both as and their responsibilities as passengers and as drivers. Humpty yeah. Dumpty Foundation, where we raise money for equipment for children, it's hospitals, and that's a big, big thing for me. And I suppose the one which is my biggest love is that I sit on the board of the Waratahs. And don't laugh. I know that's a difficult thing to say at the <laughs> moment because they're not. we haven't had the best season. Yeah. But I love my rugby and I <coughs> particularly love women's rugby and I've been a big supporter um, of the push for in, uh, increasing the number of women in rugby. Speaking of about mentoring, are you ma- you're mentoring women in sport. Uh, what, um, yeah, well, I've been asked to be involved with the Minerva Foundation. So okay. So... Um, we're working out who that's going to be. The really interesting thing is they don't want me to mentor any of the rugby girls. So w- they, they want me to do a completely different sport. Why, why, not, why do they not oh, want to Oh, I think it's because I, th- I already know the rugby girls. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they think it's probably, I think they think it's a good idea that I go elsewhere and do someone else. So we're having a conversation about that at the moment. So there's a, that's, a, that's a wide range of boards you're on. Um, how much time does it take, like being a member of all those boards? Um, so I worked it out the other day. It's probably a day a fortnight to cover all of them. So oh. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, because um, they don't all meet monthly, so yeah. So yeah. a fortnight's about right. So the work-life balance now, you've have it all in check. Yeah, well, I don't have any children at home. Um, I don't have a partner. I don't have to worry about keeping a bloke happy. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have put it that way. <laughs> um, I don't have to worry about any of that. <laughs> but my work-life, ba- no, my work-life balance is terrific because um, I am, I'm able to work, because I run my own business, I can choose. So, for example, this year I'll take two weeks off and go to the Rugby World Cup. Yep. But I do get to spend time with my, I love my children. I love my family. I get time to spend with my grandchildren. I now have four. So um, they're really important in my life and I have lots of time to spend time with them. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. We've got some questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one is from Sarah and it's, you were forced to deviate from your five-year plan and it worked out. Do you think there's any value in making a plan to achieve, do you, do you think there's any value in making a plan to achieve your career goals? Oh, I absolutely think it's really important. I mean, I, as I said, have been focused, but not properly focused. So I, when I made the five-year plan, it actually got me into a, a action. You know, it started to do things. I would say, though, about any five-year plan or any career plan, be prepared for an opportunity. And that's what I did. I mean, I had an opportunity thrown at me, which I didn't expect as quickly as it came. And instead of saying, oh, I'm not ready, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I shouldn't step up, I went, absolutely, I'm stepping up, I'm having a go. What was the worst thing that could have happened? I wouldn't have won the pre-selection. And then, of course, what I would have done is gone and said to my then-husband, we have to move, I've got to find another seat. Um, I'm sure he would have been thrilled about that, let me tell you. But, I mean, (laughs) you know, take the opportunity. Um, Be prepared for when things are thrown at you to grab them with both hands and have a go. This is from someone who didn't put the name down. Okay, so have you have any burnt out politicians approached your company, and what would your advice be to them now compared to twenty years ago? Uh, so I've had I've had not burnt out politicians. What I've had is people who've retired, um, who've I've kind of had conversation more of a coffee, you know, because the one thing which one thing which p- um, politicians find really difficult to cope with is you know you go from having this incredibly you know, 24-7 lifestyle, as I said, on call, being really busy, to basically having to do nothing. And that's really hard to cope with. I mean, when I when I lost the leadership, um, uh, we used to go out to dinner, my family, I'd take the kids out to dinner on a Sunday night. And I before I left, um, my diary used to be printed out. And my diary was in 15-minute increments, because that's how busy I was. Yeah. And I opened it up, and it was blank page after page after page of blank and so I um, ended up at the you know, dinner with my kids and I just burst into tears like I, I'm sobbing uncontrollably and um, they said to me well, you know what's wrong and I said well you know I've got nothing to do with my life and my daughter then said well you know, go find something else which you can do and, and she was right I had to find something else but that's what happens you go from being so busy to not being busy at all so I've had conversations with a number of politicians actually on both sides Um, which are about there is life after politics and you have to work out what you want to do to make sure that you feel as fulfilled, maybe not as fulfilled, but at least as much as you can be fulfilled Mm. as you were as a politician. And so, yeah, I've had a few conversations with people like that. Do you believe that you need powerful connections to get ahead? Um, It doesn't say in politics here, but if you don't have those connections, how do you get going in the startup world? 
Um, so in the startup world, as opposed to politics, I think uh, they're two different things. Yeah, there's so two different questions there, I think. So in politics um, these days, uh, you have to actually... <laughs> I had a young lady come to see me the other day who wants to be a politician, and the very first question I asked was, oh, have you joined the Liberal Party? And she went, oh, no, not yet. And I said, well, that might be a good start. You know, yeah. join, a, join a political party. In a political party, it's very different to how I got pre-selected. You do actually need to get known within the party. Mm. Um, but they are always looking for good people. So I think not necessarily powerful connections, but the right connections within a political party are important. Um, in the startup world, I think you need to have people around you who know what they're doing because there's a whole lot of stuff. You'll have a really good idea, but you need really good people who are about finance, about law, all those sorts of things. That's what you need rather than big, powerful connections. And any other plans then for the future? So, look, to be honest, I've got enough on my plate at the I moment. Think that I've sounds got like a, um, you've got a number I've of got a, You know, we're, we're getting an increasing number of clients, which is keeping both Lisa and I very busy. So, that's, you know, work is keeping me very busy. Um, I do love my rugby. I do love my sport. So, I will go to the Rugby World Cup. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'll go to Japan. So excited about going to Japan. When's, when's, the, when's the Rugby World Cup? End of this year, September, October. Okay, lovely. Um, so, I went to Japan two years ago because we played the Sun Wolves, the Waratahs played the Sun Wolves, and I went up there and it was the first visit I'd had to Japan in 50 years. Oh so wow. it had changed a little, yeah. but we only went to Tokyo, so I'm really looking forward to you know going from the top. I'm going from Sapporo all the way down to Oita, so that'll be great fun. Beautiful. I will go to the Olympics I back in Japan again the following year. So I suppose, my for me, trying to find time to do all those things is yeah. probably the greatest challenge, Yeah. Um, but they're the things that keep me sane and... Yeah, a lot of fun in my life. Yeah, and having a nice time. Yeah, and spend. You know, as I said, I you know I I like being able to spend time with my grandchildren. Have you discovered 4D experiences at events? Oh my God, you have to go to 4D. 4D, what's 4D? You know, 3D where you put the yeah yeah yeah. Well, 4D is where you sit in the chair and the whole thing moves and like we saw Aquaman and we kept on getting sprayed with water. Oh, brilliant! So seriously like cool. So seriously cool. So uh, I have a name now to take my two older grandchildren to a 4D experience once a month. So you know, uh, simple pleasures. It's a simple absolutely, pleasures. these are simple things. That Fantastic. Well, Kerry, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here today. And then hopefully then maybe we'll get Lisa on next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she, you think I can talk. You should meet my daughter. I'm uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kerry. Thanks for having me.